I have a new this. This is a cheap and cheerful voice recorder module. It's based around a CPU and a blob. This is probably a ubiquitous 8051 clone. It may be a particular kind of 8051 called an AC1082, which is why I originally got this. And this is its storage, which is a small flash chip. What this will do is it will record a voice clip using the built-in microphone here and play it back on demand. I will demonstrate. Testing, one, two, three. So let's try that a bit closer to the microphone. Testing, one, two, three. Sound quality leaves a great deal to be desired. Now, the reason I got this is because some of these AC1082 based devices actually store their programs on the flash chip, which means they can be reprogrammed. And the AC1082 has a whole bunch of CPU extensions that make programming for the 8051 considerably better. This, unfortunately, probably isn't one, but I thought it would be interesting, since I have a spare device of no particular value, to try and dump that flash chip and see what there is that's on it. Almost certainly nothing particular of interest. I mean, just the audio data encoded in some peculiar way. But uh, I have never actually managed to dump one of these little flash chips before, so uh, this could be entertaining. So before I actually get out the, uh, the EEPROM programmer, a quick tour of some of the components. This is the heart of the thing. It's a blob processor. Uh, what this is, is a silicon chip glued directly to the PCB and then covered with black epoxy to protect it. It's the cheapest way of deploying chips on a board. They're a real bane to reverse engineer because, of course, there's no labels and none of the pins are accessible. It is possible to uh, etch off the epoxy to expose the chip, but the chip usually doesn't survive this process. This is the flash storage chip. It's a XT25F16B. Uh, it's a two megabyte device. Uh, it speaks SPI, so there's a serial input output protocol to the processor. Uh, it's a pretty capable device. They are incredibly cheap and as you can see, tiny. We have here a bunch of passives to do with uh, connecting up various external devices. The red wires here are the record enable button, so that if I press the button attached to that, it will start recording. And then again, to make it stop. These two black wires are for the playback button, and these can also be replaced with a light sensor. This allows you to hide one of these things inside like a uh, gift box so that when you open the lid it plays back the pre-recorded message. There's a number of interesting looking test pads that I need to investigate. One of them is probably for a status LED. Uh, that might be this thing here labeled 0R. We'll have to do some experimentation there. This silver thing here is the microphone and three button cells to actually power the thing. It doesn't use a lot of battery and in standby mode, it appears to use practically none. So here I have my trusty mini laptop set up with the EEPROM uh, programmer plugged into it and we are going to connect it up to the flash chip here. Uh, now, um, full disclaimer, I've tried this before so I know it doesn't work, but let's just walk through it anyway. So the first thing you need is a adapter to allow you to connect the EEPROM programmer, which of course takes DIP uh, style EEPROMs to the flash chip here. That's done using this test clip. So we plug this in like so. And then the test clip is supposed to clip on to the EEPROM. Let's get it lined up properly, more or less.
like it's not right. Like so. And it should be now possible to just read it directly. Pin one is lined up properly, so we just tell the Mini Pro software to read. Um, and it immediately fails to detect the chip. All these SPI ROMs uh, have the same command set and pinout, so that should have worked. Now, one possibility is that because it's actually connected up to the CPU which is running, then that is interfering with the read process. So let us make it not run by removing one of these batteries, like so. Now try that again. And you see, we now get a different result, but it still has failed to detect the chip. Just just that a bit. So the problem here now could be that because this is now connected to the CPU, it's failing to uh, talk to the flash chip properly. That is, the CPU is interfering with the communications. That is possible because the EEPROM program is, is going to be trying to power the flash chip and since that's connected to the CPU, then it may be trying to power the CPU as well. However, I know that people have done this with these boards before, so I suspect that that's not the problem. Instead, what I think is happening is that this clip is not making good contact with the flash chip. So what I'm going to do is try and solder some actual pins onto that to give uh, better contact. So here I've got a couple of these four-way header things. These use the standard tenth of an inch uh, spacing. You may be able to notice, if you look hard, that the pin spacing on the flash chip does not match the pin spacing on the header pins. So we're going to have to do a bit of work here. All right, that one wasn't so bad. And once more, testing one, two, three. Good. So hopefully that will be all the soldering. And it was pretty janky, but it does seem to have worked. Um, I don't know whether they've made proper contact yet, but it's worth a try. So now I need to put the soldering iron away, get out the laptop again, and cook it up and see if we can read it. 
So here it is, wired up, hopefully correctly, no batteries in. So moment of truth time. Nope, hasn't found anything. Does it want the batteries in it? Nothing. Um, um, I didn't wire up that last pin. The one that is connected to ground. Maybe it does need that. Because that was duplicated elsewhere. That one's a little bit bent. So let's try that one. Goes to here. But still nothing. Curses. Uh, I don't want to be too rough with it. All these badly bodged solder joints will just come right off. There we go. It's gone on. And nothing. Well, I was hoping, but... Uh... So, either my solder joints haven't made contact, which is entirely plausible. It looks okay, I have to admit. Or there's something weird about this flash chip. So I do have a backup plan B. So let us head that way. So this is plan B, which is my eight channel signal analyzer. So I've wired it up, hopefully correctly. And what I'm gonna do is hit the run button. Uh, let's actually set the number of samples rather bigger. Hit the run button, then tell this to play. Testing and see what we get out. So, Testing. One, two, three. good, that was 50 million samples. So let's zoom out, right, we got some stuff. So the ch data channels here match the pins in the data sheet. So pin one is chip select. You can see here the chip select line is being asserted and deasserted during the run. Pin two is data output, that looks like data. Three and four are unused. Ah, oh, four is not connected, four is power. So three is write protect. So yes, unused. I'm gonna notice that one does seem to be brought out to a test pad, I'm not sure why. Uh, five is data in, six is the clock, and seven is hold. That also looks like it's unused. Oh, and that's the one that's tied to high. So let's turn off the ones we don't want, which is zero, three, four, and seven. Uh, let's get rid of the UART decoders I was using the last time I did anything with this. Uh, we're zoomed in way too far to actually make out anything in the data, but let's try and add a decoder. Nope, not that one, this one. SPI flash. Okay, so now I need to associate channels. So we decided that D2 was data out. That's MISO. Uh, 
chip select is D1. Clock, I believe, was... Um, oh yeah, you have the pin out here. Clock was on D6. And mozzie, master out, slave in, is... Uh, pin 5. Okay, so now it's decoding what it saw. So, if we zoom in a bit. So, this is just noise, which we think we can ignore. Whether it will upset the rest of the decode, I'm not sure. We are looking here at individual bits. Some of these look look like it's just completely failed to decode anything. I've been a little bit suspicious about this signal analyzer, to be honest. We seem to be getting an awful lot of right disabled commands. So on playback, I would expect it to be transferring lots of data from the device to the processor. So let's just try that again, but I'll give it a little bit more time before pressing the button. Testing, one, two, three. So here, when it zoomed in, you can see D6 is the clock. These do not look like same clock pulses to me, to be honest. Um, I'd expect that to be more of a square wave. Do I need to crank up the, the rate? Ah, that's why it's so confused. The It's glitchy data. So you can see this is supposed to be, as far as I can tell, a single clock pulse. Unless this thing is running really quick. Uh, the flash chip can operate up to, I think, 120 megahertz. But I doubt very much whether the blob processor in here can do that. Let's just crank it up one more time. This may not actually even work. Testing. One, two, three. Yeah, it's not working. It's just refusing to uh, sample. So what have we got near the beginning of this thing? Yeah, you can see that the bursts of uh, noise, each one of these is supposed to be a nice square clock pulse, but the signal analyzer is failing to actually, you know, analyze. That is annoying. Uh, this is the second time I've had problems with this signal analyzer. I suspect it may just be junk and I should ditch it and get something that's more expensive. Now, I do have a plan C. Plan C is to use my oscilloscope. However, plan C is rather harder to show on camera due to the fact the oscilloscope screen is here and I have yet to figure out how to get it to do how to do screen recording on it. So, much like the contents of the casserole currently in my oven, the plot is thickening. I have hooked my oscilloscope up, which is this horrible tangle of wires, and got out an old cell phone to record the screen with so, so that you can see what it's doing. Now, it turns out that this oscilloscope actually has some protocol decoders, which took me ages to find, which include SPI. I'm not convinced it's actually doing terribly well with this, for a reason I will show you. But I can press the single capture button, 
and then go on the device and this is what we get. Now, these four tracers, uh, the top one is chip select, this one is clock, and this is uh, miso, master in, slave out, and this one is mozzie, master out, slave in. I think, I might have those backwards, I doubt it. Uh, actually tracing the wires in this tangle is a pain. Now, remember that when I had the signal analyzer hooked up, there was a big patch of noise at the beginning of the capture that I dismissed as garbage. I don't think it is. If we zoom in, and let me find the beginning of the trace. Uh, this way. The knobs turn in not exactly the most obvious direction. Of course, it might be better if I wasn't using my left hand for this. But if I use my right hand, I bump the phone. Okay. So here you can see uh, chip select gets asserted, and then we get this little bursts of eight clock pulses. So what it appears to be doing is talking to the flash chip rapidly at a high clock rate. Uh, I think I can actually persuade this to measure that for me. So if I select channel two, no wait, the clock is channel four, which is blue, which is already selected. So if I press the frequency button, it then measures the frequency of this trace at about eight megahertz. That is pretty quick. But this allows it to send a bunch of bytes to the flash chip and then get back a response. So these are the bytes that are showing up. They're in ASCII. Um, let's see if I can configure this. So decode. Uh, format from ASCII to hex. There we go. And to get rid of this, I think I click. Yep. Uh, this is still new. I am somewhat struggling to come to terms with it. But it's, uh, so far, it seems to be pretty awesome. So we can see bytes going to the flash chip. And then, do we get a response? Uh, well, I think I might need to back up a little. I think it's having trouble decoding if it can't see the beginning of the trace which is not terribly helpful, but we can clearly see here data going out, data coming back. So it's talking to the chip. So rather than all that stuff being noise, we do actually seem to be seeing correct communication uh, in the signal analyzer. But then if we zoom out we then get very short pulses on the clock at wide intervals. Let me try and home in on one. So, oh, oh, I haven't done this yet. Uh, right, what this is doing is it's reading a byte. That's what it's doing. Right, so almost certainly what the flash chip is doing when it's playing back is it's talking, flash chip, what the processor, that is this blob here, is doing when it's talking to the flash chip is it sets up various communications, it looks to see uh, if there's anything on the flash chip, then it sets up a byte read transaction, which basically it'll just return bytes until further notice. And then whenever it wants a byte, all it does is it toggles the clock 
eight times. It gets back a bite. In this case, it's hex nine one. And then there's a long pause before it requests the next byte. This is because the bytes it reads uh, are going to be fed into the audio decoder. And the audio decoder is going to consume byte quite slowly compared to the microcontroller. Good. Right. What this has taught us is that the communications on this thing make sense. So... I think the next thing I want to do is to try and use the uh, the EEPROM programmer to look at the flash chip and at the same time record what's coming out to see what's going on. I actually have a suspicion. I think that the flash chip here is holding the chip select line deasserted that is high. That will, let me zoom all the way out. So high means off, and I think it's providing more power to keep it high than the EEPROM reader is supplying to lower it. Therefore, the flash chip is never waking up, and this thing is never seeing any data. So the next step is to get out the laptop again and plug in the uh, EEPROM programmer. All right, let's see how this works. Now, the first thing is to just do another capture, just to show that the, uh, the lines are all actually still hooked up properly. So now we run the uh, Mini Pros detector And nothing happens. Interesting. Right, the capture level is not right. So if I adjust this, adjust the trigger. Okay, got something. So what are we seeing? Great, I can't reach the controls without either blocking something with an arm, either camera. Well, you can see the chip selectors at the top, and that's looking very feeble. It's being lowered by the EEPROM programmer, but not very much. Uh, at the same time, the EEPROM programmer is lowering uh, the clock and uh, MISO. So I think I was right, and the EEPROM programmer is failing to assert chip select hard enough to make the chip wake up, because the microcontroller here has... Uh, basically has its finger on that particular control line. Okay, so next let's remove one of the batteries to turn this thing off. Okay, so now nothing happens. So let's do that again. So capture. Okay, come on. So that actually made the signal go up. This is now in dead slow mode. You can see it tracing the signal. So clearly with the battery removed, I think we have the opposite problem in that the lines are not floating high properly. That is probably because I haven't hooked up the VCC line on this, because it's trying to power the, yeah, it's trying to power the flash chip from the EEPROM programmer, but I haven't given it a power line. So let's just do that. Okay, now power is VCC which is pin 8. So that's pin 8 here. Uh, 
and same pin here like so don't think anything happened on the oscilloscope now let's try that again and that's still not doing it right what happens if you put a battery back in See that goes high, and then when we try to actually do a to try to do anything, it uh, glitches down a bit. So that is at uh, zero volts. So if we poke it. it goes up to about 5 volts for a moment which is wrong in order to activate the chip you have to bring chip select down it's possible that it's tried to raise it and then lower it again but I also don't have no idea what voltage the programmer is set to uh, I can change that actually uh... The, the VCC, so it's uh, we want VDD equals five. So voltage VDD equals five. Let's try this. Uh, ah. Like this. Right, that's done the same thing. So um, try 3.3. No. Okay. So I'm going to guess that there's something wrong with the um, something wrong with the way that the EEPROM programmer is interacting with the the blob chip. Now there's a solution and this is to cut the chip select line between the flash chip and the blob. This will render the device non-functional uh, so I will have to have a hunt around for a solution to that and also identify the various traces on the board. The casserole by the way is chestnut and brussels sprout. Okay so having unplugged the various things this one is let me just double check the data sheet pin one is chip select that's this one here and unfortunately you may just be able to see but uh, there's a row of minuscule tracks here that is where the flash chip pins connect to the device so I've got no chance of doing anything with that. However, some of these test pads look interesting. So let's uh, uh, let's actually remove. I can find my pusher thing, the battery, and turn the thing off. It doesn't have a switch. Come on. There we go. All right. And now let's do some continuity testing to see whether the chip select is brought out anywhere useful. So there's a pin here, a test pad here, just under the blob. Nope, this one. Nope, this one. Well, that's helpful. Great. Um... Just thinking about what I can do. Uh, one option is to remove the chip completely from the board. 
uh, and then use uh, then solder these things back on and use that to connect the chip back to the board to actually make it work which I th think is going to be my best option uh, this is going to be it's going to involve more skill than I really have and I'm going to have to get the hot air gun out I'm also a little bit concerned by the the this goop here which is um there's the focus gone that's a bit better which is hot glue because applying heat here is going to melt the hot glue and it may even like boil or can does hot glue catch fire but I, I think that's my only real option um, I could probably cut these but trying to reconnect them again afterwards is going to be impossible yeah let's try taking the uh, taking the chip off well, I have eaten my casserole, which was very nice, if a little enthusiastic, and got the hot air gun out. So, let's have a go at this. So, power on. You can probably hear it. Wait for it to heat up. I am very bad with the hot air gun. I've had very little experience with it, as it's brand new. So, I don't really know how to work it. Anyway, that's it, hopefully up to temperature. Uh, so I set it to 375, which may not be hot enough. I'm hoping to melt enough solder that the uh, pin header will drop off. Like so. That worked quite well. So let's try the other pin header. Like so. Oh yes, indeed, the hot glue has melted. You can see it there. Okay. Um, I now need. There we are. Now I'm going to try and heat up the chip itself. Get that back on camera. So hopefully we should see the solder soften. Okay, it's going shiny, which is good. Let's try this side. Let's try a bit more. Okay, I think it's going shiny. Yeah. Okay, so, oh, wow. <laughs> that was easy. I was expecting that to be a lot harder. Awesome. Um. Okay, well, let's shift this out of the way and pick this up again. And let's just toast the legs lightly to try and melt the solder just to get it a little bit more uniform. That looks fine. Okay, well, <laughs> that took much less time than I thought it was going to. Next step is back to the EEPROM reader. So here we are. The EEPROM reader actually came with this, which is a special adapter for reading uh, eight pin chips. And I'm just looking to see where pin one is. I think it's top left. 
though it shouldn't really matter. So what you do is you pick up the chip, just rotate it so it's the right way round. The dot indicates pin one. You press this home like this, put the chip into the reader and then let go and it clamps down with really rather rather good alignment in just the right place. And then you can put the chip into the reader, like so. So now let's run our probe and see what happens. It has identified what it is. It's a B4015, which is not in MiniPro's database, but we should be able to uh, we should be able to tell it that it's a similar device. Uh, here we go. P, I think it's a PM25F16B at SOIC 8. I think that's what it is. It's the same code as this, which is an XT25F16B except by a different manufacturer. In fact, it turns out that PM and XT are both the same people, so... Uh, PN, not PM, okay. So now we read it. Right, it's a different device, therefore the chip ID doesn't match. We tell it to go ahead anyway. And now it's reading. Decently quickly. And done. Okay, and what do we get? Here is the contents of the EEPROM. As I thought, it is in fact complete garbage. Well, not garbage. Uh, it's encoded in some way, probably ADPCM. But as far as I know, this particular format hasn't been reverse engineered. The actual device that I am I want to reverse engineer that I'm practicing with this thing stores its program on the flash chip and it has a fixed partition layout that's quite distinctive, but this isn't it. Right, well, that is how to read a 8-pin flash chip of a cheap and nasty device. Uh, of course, the cheap and nasty device is now non-functional, so I will have to find a way to... Well, I can just solder this back on, that's quite straightforward. But it would be nice to be able to... Um, be able to take put the device on and off in order to play with it. Um, now, I did manage to solder on the header pins, which are here, so it's entirely plausible that I might be able to make my own adapter. Wait, one. So this came with the Mini Pro, and it is indeed a SOIC adapter, but it's the other way round than the one I'm looking for. This, that little board there, will let me solder this chip onto it and put header pins on and it basically does the same job as this. So that's not quite what I wanted. Now, well, what I could do is...